we both went through some some dark times. I mean, for me, we got to one point, hat and locks, and I really needed a sleep. Not so much a sleep, but to, to just sit down and have a lie down and just rest everything and just reset my mind. It worked after, but coming into those locks, it was probably a, a big dark uh, point. I'll go through it completely different, like, so Rich will keep talking, whereas I need to just really focus in. I kind of start taking everything in around me, so, like, I'll start focusing in on how the light's hitting the trees or how it's hitting the water, you know, just little things like that, just to take my mind completely away from what's actually going on. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Running Tales Podcast. I'm Craig Lewis, and this week we are breaking down what it takes to run an extreme endurance race. I'm joined by Ben Davis and Richard Wilcox, who recently completed the Mammoth 145-mile Grand Union Canal Race. The pair who finished the race in 42 hours and 22 minutes are taking part in the Canal Slam, a 420-mile three-race challenge that will see them complete another 145-miler at the Kennet and Avon Canal Race and the mere 130-mile Leeds and Liverpool Canal Race. I spoke to Ben and Richard about what it takes to prepare physically and mentally to take on such distances, about race nutrition, sleep deprivation, overcoming extreme tiredness, aches and pains, and about the feeling of crossing the finish line after it all. I started our chat by asking Ben exactly what the race they took part in at the end of May was. It was the Grand Union Canal Race, uh, 145 miles, but this year the two of us are taking on what? that company called the canal slam so it's um 245 mile races finishing with a 130 mile race the first two have got eight weeks between them and then the second and third have got four weeks between them um to get ready for like for them but yeah that's that's about it as far as the uh sort of challenge that we're we're going for we're just a bit stupid enough to take it on <laughs> and, and at the moment it's uh it's part one of that has been ticked off that original original 145 mile race which just to me sounds oh, mind-blowing but yeah my, my first question was how, how do you get yourself ready for a for a run like that both both physically and I suppose how do you get mentally prepared to believe that you can do something like that I think we're both different when it comes to our styles of running so uh yeah Rich can take this one yeah uh, Ben loves the canal uh, and he loves these sorts of races where mine, I like the mountains more. And obviously running in mountains, and it's totally different. So uh, me personally, I've, I've totally changed the way that I've trained for these, both mentally and physically. I just knew there'd be a different kind of toll on the body. So I thought, yeah, uh, I think we've... With mountain races, you've just got to be up there to train and, and and get your body used to it and the terrain and the weather. And so it is quite straightforward, whereas with this, it's different. It's totally different. And, and so I just thought to myself, I've got to approach this differently. And so about six months ago, I, I just totally changed my training regimen. I, I, I just thought, I need to strengthen uh, all the ligaments in my legs. It's good. It's it's just totally flat. There is some obviously when you go up and down locks, you have a bit of respite, but the rest of it, it's it's just the same and same for hours on end. And I, I just thought, how can I combat the the uh, you know later in the race that those uh, those the tiredness and and also the that you may get an injury through the, you know, through through doing it for how many miles. So I just, I just started. I just went back. I started. Uh, my foundations was gym work. So uh, I did the gym twice a week, doing upper body and legs. And I mean, hard. I mean, I'd done gym work before and and just really messed about with it. Uh, but this time, I I listened to a few podcasts for strength training for what runners and uh, I can't remember which one it was but one said to me most runners just use lighter weights and uh, this one I've said in the podcast if you're not feeling it the next day after a leg that day then you're not training properly in the gym and that just stuck with me 
And so I pushed it really hard. And and then obviously you got doms after the day after and sometimes the day after that and fitting in. So all my training fitted in those around those two days in the gym. And yeah, it paid off. I feel strong and I think it's helped me in, in every bit of other running as well. I think once I finish these, I don't think I'm gonna change my training too much. And I yeah. think Ben was the same. Obviously, Ben can tell you, but I think without telling each other, I think we went sort of down the same sort of route. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm going to come to you on that in a second, Ben, because I've been watching your training a little bit through through Twitter and so on. But but Rich, I just wondered you, you mentioned that you've done more mountain running than um, uh, than this kind of canal running. But have you taken on, because I know Ben has, have you taken on this kind of distance in the past? And uh, if not, how how did that how did that feel mentally to go, why in word, I've got this huge distance to do? Well, I've only been running, I've been running under three years and I think it comes with the mindset, to be fair. I, I, I started running and I decided to do uh, uh, a couch to 100 miles in a year. Uh, and I picked a mountain race as well, uh, and that's how me and Ben met each other. To be fair, within within that sort of of, of first year, and so he, he, I think he, I think you just meet people who are like who are just like sort of like minded, uh, and say, do you think this would be a good thing to do? And they're like, yeah, yeah, let's let's try this, let's try that, and so and and so yeah, the mindset. I think he, I think with some people. They have to work in it, and I think some people have, have have just got it there. They just need to to bring it out a bit more. It's not saying that you don't have to work at it because I think every race is different, and 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 if you don't approach if you approach it with a blase attitude, then I think you're going to set yourself up to to fail. Uh, but yet, uh, I've not done 145 miles, and I've not I'm not completed 100 miles in over a year so it was like jump straight in there uh just believe in the training that I've done and, and believe in myself that I can get to the end I think it was that sort of sort of mindset I think if you're trying good then you're taking out that sort of doubts if you can't if you if you if you if you've not put the training in, then you've got that extra added doubt, have I done enough? And so that can play. And you don't really want that to go into something so big. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. No, I, I always love talking to to you guys who do and girls who do amazing distances. I'm always struck by the kind of uh, the real positive attitude of, uh, you know, most people go from couch to 5k, but you just thought, <laughs> thought, okay, couch to 100 miles. Um, but, but, but Ben, just turning to you, I know that this time you've, you've done an awful lot more strength training and you've really been focused on that, but that on the flip side, you kind of have with, uh, with a young child as well, you haven't maybe had enough time to do as much running as you might have liked. No, I haven't. That was my biggest concern going into it. And I, I honestly thought that was going to be my my biggest letdown so I was like really I was really quite stressed like going into this one because last year I'd done so much running going into it but no strength work I've always neglected strength work and and, and like gym work and stuff so this year it kind of the gym like lent itself to me in a way with the little and because it's literally around the corner if ever I got a call if ever I get a call I need to come home um I'm literally like two minutes away um rather than if I go for a run unless I run just laps around the block I'm you know I could be like half an hour or so away or depending on where we are so utilizing that was was brilliant um and I really do think it it paid off in the end um and once we got running all the stress had, of of everything had gone everything just felt good just went into it feeling like a cold spring really ready to just ready to run and actually have like put down some some big miles um because it's been it was a few it's been a few I say it's not been as long as Richie's but it's been a good few months since I put down a really decent run so I was I was I was quite looking forward to seeing how much the strength training and like the gym work would really would really like help in this kind of genre of running and I think it did I really do I think it really did help especially in the 
like the latter stages of it when normally everything's starting to break down. I normally get some really bad issues with the front of like not my shins, but I, I think it's the anterior something like the muscle down the side of the shin on the front. I always get bad problems there, um, which stops me walking in the later stages. So I end up having to like hobble run. But this time, nothing, absolutely nothing. Like the legs were, so whatever I've been doing has uh, been working. But we didn't, we didn't mention it to each other at all, like what training we were doing or anything. And for a good few months, and then we just started talking like a, a few weeks ago before the Grand Union about our training and whatnot. And we were literally doing exactly the same things and like just training hard in the gym and when the legs have, have had it in the gym like the next day go on to a body and stuff to just help the core and everything else that's going to be moving especially for that distance I, I don't think strength training which also I neglect terribly can really be under uh underplayed um I did a uh uh, a podcast with with David Abbott last week, uh, uh, who who does loads of amazing tips on Twitter, and he was talking about the real importance of weightlifting and how that's helped him to do uh, sub three hour marathons, which is obviously uh, you know a kind it's kind of a different skill set in running, but it still yeah. requires those same things. And uh, Michelle did the London marathon this year, and she just didn't have time to do much running at all. Was doing lots of strength training and was a bit similar to you was a bit worried about it all but went out there and had one of her uh, wasn't setting any world records or anything but just one of the easiest runs she's had on a marathon just because of this strength training so yeah I think it is it's hugely important but I guess the other thing and maybe if I turn to you first Rich on on a run like this is how does it work in terms of nutrition and a support crew and and all that sort of thing yeah it's it's uh it's a it's a funny one uh uh, these canal races because uh, you can either have a crew or, or or use their checkpoints. Whereas with every other race I've done, uh, it's just been their checkpoints, and you can have a crew as well. But with this, it it was uh, I'll say a big thank you to to the the two lads Dan and Chris who who came and crewed for us because I don't. Without them giving up their weekend, then then we couldn't have actually have, have achieved uh, uh, this, and so it is a it is a big thing. Uh, nutrition wise, I think it was a big one for me. It's constantly changing, and I can remember this time uh, getting into into the the one tens and, and just being sick of. Uh, the electrolytes that I was drinking and the food that I've been eating. And uh, it, a lot of it, it is more sugary based, obviously. And I realised that I probably need to change my my nutrition on 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 rice, uh, basically broaden what I'm eating. And, and that's quite a hard thing to do. Uh, but most of my most of my nutrition is probably it's like a, a five-year-old's birthday party. <laughs> uh, it, it's all snacks and it's it's all high sugar or it uh, might be pastries and sausage, little, you know what I mean, like cocktail sausages. Or I try to get all the main like macro uh, nutrients obviously in there uh, as well. But uh, but yeah, I think I think it opened my eyes to to looking. At different strategies on on fueling, which I probably didn't have before. So it's it's like one of those hurdles now. I think uh, the big thing that's come away from me is that nutrition, is that having a broad, sort of more broader palate, having fruit, uh, and and having a a really good varied sort of. Uh, I always think about the cost because obviously there's a cost to it and. Uh, you can have a lot of wastage if you haven't eaten it, but I just think, uh, I think that you do need to do it. I think it's one of those sacrifices. The same way is having enough there that you don't get 110 miles in and and stop eating because you've just had enough of 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 what you've got. So yeah. going forward, that that's probably going to be one that I'm gonna I'm gonna look at. And and the and the fluid side as well, because uh, 
It was the first time I didn't use uh, salt tablets. I just concentrated on electrolytes and obviously the uh, the, the ones that you drop into your drinks. And uh, I'm probably more likely going to go back to to squashing salt tablets. I think I think they I think they're like dead in my sort of uh, taste buds going into it. So so it it was a big thing to and. And probably go away and and look at what other other ultra runners use and what works for them. But I think it's so individual, yeah. Because our tastes are so in, individual as well. It can be what's good for somebody might not be good for me, and and vice versa. So it's a lot of testing, and I think once you've been ultra running for a long time, you you forget that side of it because you you just go to those tried and tested and and not bother testing anything else out. So I think uh, I haven't got much time to do, but I think I'm probably just going to, on race days, probably just get some stuff that I never ate before and, and just go and try uh, a couple of weeks before or just bring some on race day. And now Ben, uh, he pulled out some fruit, he pulled out some apples, and I was like, oh, I'll have an apple. And the apple was tasted so nice. Uh, and that's one thing that I do love about ultra running. You get that so far into it. Everything you eat, everything you taste, it's like the best thing you've ever tasted. So those apples that we deployed later on in the race were just like, it was just beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And Ben, I was going to ask, uh, it, it, I think I, Rich may have just given it up me the answers, but I was going to ask, were you were you eating the kind of same stuff or, or were you looking at him going, oh my God, he's having more gummy bears and more sweets? No, that's normally me. Like I'm, I mean, Rich, Rich is normally like my my main crew, my main go to crew man. So like that's what made this course, what is making this sort of race series quite quite special to the both of us. But yeah, I'm normally like packs and packs of sweets, biscuits, crisps every now and again. But it's mainly just jelly sweets and sugar for me because sugar works really well. Like I find for me, but I, this time. I think we got to about 130 odd miles and both of us were struggling with like acid reflux. Like it was just, it, it was like almost like we were on the verge of being sick, but without being sick. And it was just, just so much sugar that we, we'd we been consuming throughout the day with the heat as well, because it was exceptionally hot over the whole weekend. And like, there's not much respite in, on the canal. And it has this cruel way of when you think, you're in the shade for a while, you'll cross a bridge and you're on the other side of the canal and you're in the baking sun just staring at the other side of the canal looking at nice, beautiful shade. Um, yeah. And that, that was just evil in its own way. But, yeah, this this time around got me thinking a lot more about my nutrition and going on, like, working on the weather w- with it as well and maybe going more fluid-based um, with the different companies like Tailwind and those kind of those kind of um, sort of drinks, um, depending on what the weather's like. I don't think I could go through like what we did last weekend again because the pain in my throat after like 20 odd miles of just every time you like burp or anything like that, you've just got acid coming up in your throat. So it was excruciating at times. But yeah, that, that apple. Uh, I think it was at mile 135 or something like that. It was like the last, we had 10 miles to go. And um, it was just the nicest thing I've ever tasted <laughs> in my life. I've completely forgot I had him in my box and until we opened opened up the box and I wasn't going to take anything. And I carried on walking and Rich saw the apples. And I was like, yeah, bring me one. So, yeah, that, they were great. And bananas earlier on as well. We had, like, some, some chap, didn't we, on the canal. He was, like, just down drinking some some cans of cider on the side of the canal just started randomly talking to us about what we were doing and we mentioned it to him like you know what we were doing and that and next minute he comes running up behind us with this like handful of bananas and that um just wanted to help us out we were umming and ahhing like oh you know we're having a laugh and a joke we're like oh, i wonder what he's done to these bananas and then we were just like you know what sod it oh, i really <laughs> want to eat these and they they're just the best. I'm not I'm not a massive fan of bananas. Like I have to really really fancy them. But oh man, they were so nice. They really were. 
I don't even know who that guy was, but if he ever listens to this podcast, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> How tempting by that stage was the, were the cans of cider as well? Oh, uh, well... <laughs> I mean, both of us don't drink, but it, I think if they were, if we could see the uh, condensation running down the outside of them, they would probably been, uh, yeah, I'd have probably been fighting him for them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I've looked at your your roots on Strava and so on, and you have the the mileage breakdown and so on, and uh, and you guys obviously set off at a sort of nice jaunty ten minute miles sort of thing, and obviously as it went on, naturally it, the the pace slowed slowed down. But did did you have a did you have a plan for how quick you were going to do it and at what point you thought, I'm going to start walking, or was it just, I'm tired now, I need to walk? I don't I, I don't know about Ben, but I, I didn't really go in with, with a plan. Uh, I knew that I needed to be quite uh, conservative at the start, try to conserve as much energy as I could. For me, there wasn't no plan as such, just to be conservative at the start. And then see how, how I get how we get on, uh, and I think it worked it worked pretty well. And I think there was going into into it as well as we got further on into the race. We had like we had good little spurts as well. And I think there was one was initiated by Ben, and I think another one was initiated by me, uh, where we did get a little bit faster. I don't think we could have planned it any better. I don't think. Uh, I think it's just one of them of, of, of just going out conservative and seeing what the body, uh, uh, the body, what the body is like. Most of the time, I think, yeah, I'm going to be conservative, and then I just fly out and then like bombing at mile ten normally. Uh, and so, yeah, <laughs> I think it was a, it was a it was a good breakthrough for me to like, yeah, I can start up slow. Uh, I don't need to do like like six minute miles and keep up with the front people. I can just let them go off and, and do my own and do my own thing and, and be conservative. So that was a big takeaway from me. Yeah. And, and was there a bit at all where you sort of thought, oh, I've hit the wall now or this is really painful or, oh my word, I'm going to struggle now? Or did you feel fairly as, as comfortable as you can do when taking on that kind of distance? I think we, we both went through some... Hat and lock. Some... I'm just saying hat and locks. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we both went through some some dark times. I mean, for me, we got to one point, hat and locks, and I really needed a sleep. Uh, I've just really not so much a sleep, but to, to just sit down and have a lie down and just rest everything and just reset my mind. It's not so much sleep, sleeping. It just, it's just like a, I feel just needed a reset, and I think it worked. It worked after, but coming into those locks, yeah, it was probably a a big dark uh, point for me. And and we all approach it differently. Like I'm probably one of these ones who probably don't show it as much. So I'll be chatty all the way through a race and, and not. Sh- not show it, uh, and so we're all, so we're all differently. But yeah, I, f- I think, I think we both had some, both went into some both dark places that we, that you can only get yourself out. Really, even when you're running together, it's up to you to get yourself out of, of that, and and maintaining that sort of of discipline to to help yourself out. If that makes right. sense. I'll go through it completely different. Like, so Rich will keep talking, whereas I need to just really focus in and I just, I kind of start taking everything in around me. So, like, I'll start focusing in on how the light's hitting the trees or how it's hitting the water. Just, you know, just little things like that, just to take my mind completely away from what's actually going on. And then, like, like I'll struggle if, like, if someone tries to communicate with me in that, that kind of, like time because like I'll end up where I'm starting to get okay and then I get pulled out of my little zone just after hat and lock so we'd had sort of 20 minutes just like completely resting and I ended up like leaving there with a bit of a niggle in my knee so I was like kind of just kicking myself for for stopping but knew at the same time that there was a potential that if I hadn't stopped there then me and Rich would have become separated but 
we could have become that separated. We wouldn't have seen each other to the finish line. And that was just not, that wasn't what we set out to do. It was just every race is doing it together and finishing it together and going through the highs and lows of it together. Um, so if Rich was resting, like I was resting as well. But then as we came out of Hat and Locks, I think I was a little bit in front of Rich at the time. Um, I'd left a few minutes earlier and then Rich come like uh, running up behind me and I was like just going through this little low patch of like kicking myself for stopping and like well, that was the reason why my knee was hurting and it wasn't. My knee was just hurting because we'd done like 120 odd, 25 miles or something by that point. But like everything goes through your head and you're just kicking yourself for everything. But then Rich came up with this little, little like plan of picking a spot, like run to it. Like we'd you'd pick pick a bridge, run to the bridge, and then pick a next spot, and you walk to that spot, and then and just so we were literally run walking, and it just took my mind completely out of what was going on, and just gave us something to focus on and to aim at. And like with probably within about half an hour, we were back chatting, having a laugh just taking the piss out of each other and just having a good time again. And it really sort of changed the mood, um, which I really do think helped get us like straight through to the end. Rich, the other thing that I wanted to mention was that obviously this event, you know, you didn't, you didn't do it in, in six or seven hours, of course. How long did it, did it actually take? And what was it like sleep wise? Because you, you must have suffered from sleep deprivation as well. It took us 42 42 hours to, to 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 complete it and obviously I had not done that distance before but yet yeah, sleep deprivation it hits people uh in in different ways uh I mean I mean there was a couple who, who passed us in the latter stages uh uh I think they're probably in their twenties and it was like as if they'd just started a park run sort of thing and I was just like Gosh, I've done, I've done nearly I've done nearly forty one hours and I'm absolutely like cream crackered and uh, and this young couple come running past like as if they're on a park run uh, and and so for me it's just like yeah uh, I think your age uh, obviously it all come it all comes uh, into it I'd started to see I'd started to loosen out a little bit as just going into to Birmingham. I thought I've seen people like uh, uh, young lads with caps on standing by the side of the canal. And when I got a bit closer to them, it was just trees. Uh, and I thought, well, I'm not going to. I thought I, I've been there before in races, what I've done uh, before, where I've hallucinated. Uh, and, and so I know what's, I know what's going on. Uh, but, but yeah, so I didn't really, I just, I think one time I said, is there somebody there, Ben? And he was like, "No, nah, there's nobody there." Uh, but all the way through going to the end, uh, I was seeing people. Uh, I just knew what was happening, so I didn't really say anything yeah. <laughs> to Ben. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it is something that you have to manage. Like, like I had that rest at at, at Hatton Locks. I don't know how far it was in into the race, but I do recommend uh, people. If they can have five or ten minutes just to reset, uh, it might not be so much your, but it's just that mind. I think that mind just needs a rest from everything that you're doing, uh, just to reset and and feel fresh, fresh again. And it does work. It's surprising how how just those few minutes of just not thinking of anything or or just relaxing how it can, can invigorate your mind again. But, yeah, if you're going to do those sorts of miles and errors on your feet, then be prepared to to manage how you feel and, and what you see. Yeah. I, I think that it's good having people with you, uh, but there might come a time in a race where you're on your own, so it's it's managing your fatigue in a way that, it's going to get you to the end yeah and, and just very quickly guys because we're we're rapidly running out of time unfortunately just sort of maybe a, a minute each on how you felt as you finally completed that 145 miles and and finished that that sort of grueling achievement i think it was a massive relief like having because obviously going into the canal salon that was the first like the first race is always 
going to be the big or the setup for the next two because if we failed at that you know if we didn't finish that one then obviously going in we 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 still paid up for the next two so it's like we'd still go and do them just to get those courses done but um yeah having completed that it was a massive relief like allowing us to set up ready for the next one so ready for round two then rich i spent probably 20 hours of the rise saying to Ben when I finish I'm picture taken in the car and I'm sleeping and that's it I'm so tired now that's it and when I finish now I was like I think I spent so much time thinking right just get the first one out the way once you get the first one out the way uh, and then we can concentrate it's, it's coming alive but I was so tired going over that line I think I think what made me laugh, I said to Ben, I bet more from the end, are we gonna run at the end? And he just went, No, I'm done. And I laughed. And we both laughed and we did. We just walked across that line. It was just but I just knew that like inside I was like, Yes, we've done it. We've done it. Uh because like Ben said, it set us up for the for the next two. Uh and for me it was a big thing one yet. Yeah, I can do 145, 148 miles, whichever it was at the end. And so, yeah, it was a big one. Even though everybody else around me was just like, I was just tired and done, to be fair. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a fantastic achievement. Well done to you both. And, and um, thank you very, so much for, for talking us all through how you approach a race like that and how you get through it. Um, and good luck with the uh, with the next two to come. And thank you for joining me on, on Running Tales today. Brilliant. Cheers. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again to Ben and Richard for joining me on Running Tales this week. If you enjoyed what they had to say, if you enjoyed this week's podcast, then I just wanted to take a moment to ask you all, all our wonderful listeners, to take a little bit of time out to give us a review and a rating wherever you listen to us on Running Tales. These positive reviews mean that the podcast gets seen by a wider audience. So the more we get, then the more people get to listen to the inspiring stories of our guests. Also, if you want to see and hear more of our content, please be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Running Tales Pod, on Facebook, where our page is called Running Tales, or to check out our YouTube channel at Running Tales Pod. You can also subscribe to our newsletter by visiting runningtales.substack.com where you'll find written versions of all of these podcasts, as well as articles on all kinds of subjects from the world of running. Thanks as ever for all your support, and I'll see you next week for another Running Tales podcast.